Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to our first online Slava evening event. My name is Ian Rees, and I'm chair of Slava, the Welsh People's History Society. Thank you for joining us. This evening's discussion is a follow-on from one of our previous Saturday series of talks, which I hope you've been enjoying. The topic is Wales and Slavery. Tonight, we are welcoming back our three guest speakers, Chris Evans, Marion Gwynn, and Audrey West, to dig deeper into Wales' relationship with the slave trade, its legacy today, and how to confront these issues in a uh, historical context. The event will take the form of an extended question and answer session. When Chris, Marion, and Audrey uh, spoke at the initial event, uh, on August the 1st, there was only a limited amount of time for the Q&A at the end. And in addition, due to some technical issues, some of the questions that you, the audience, wanted to pose didn't come through. Tonight is the chance to put that right. So, without further delay, I'm going to hand you over to Darren, who is going to explain how you can join in with the session. Thank you. Right, thanks very much, Ian. Uh, you'll see a chat function. If you want to ask any questions, please feel free to add any questions. You all also interact with each other on the chat function as well. We've got quite a lot of questions we didn't get through last time, but, but, but we'd be keen to encourage any others which anybody feels they, they, they want to put forward tonight. Um, so as Ian mentioned, we're going to deal with or try to deal with the legacy of the Atlantic slave trade. I looked at Slave Voyages, which is a fantastic um, web website, which actually Chris Chris pointed me in the direction of a number of years ago. Uh, at the at the actual figures, which gives doesn't give the full picture, but slaves embarked ten million six hundred and fifty five six hundred and sixty five thousand four hundred and twenty six. Slaves, slaves disembarked nine million two hundred and three thousand five hundred and ninety seven. Died during the voyage, 12.2%. Over 40 slaves would die on each voyage. That really doesn't give us a picture. That doesn't give us any indication of the individuals. I think we've got to, we've got to try and identify the ramifications of the slave trade. I looked at um, something Ban Ki-moon said in 2008 when speaking at the uh, Transatlantic Slave Memorial Day. This chapter of human history is all the more reprehensible because of the trade yielded significant prosperity to the countries where slavery was perpetuated in the colour of law. These states paid no monetary price for their progress, but they incurred a terrible cost in the form of entrenched racism, which we still battle today. The slave trade left an indelible mark, not only because it offended the human conscience, but because it was a result of a shocking complacency complicity of nations who participated in the name of commerce for over 400 years. Today, trying to identify Wales' role in that, I'm joined by uh, three eminent historians. Uh, first is Chris Evans. Chris teaches at USW. He's about to publish with Louise Maskell, Swansea Cop, but a global history. Uh, and will publish a little bit down the line, leaving slavery behind capitalism, nationalism, and Christianity in the era, in the era of British, British emancipation. I'm also joined by Marion Gwynn. Marion is a historian with a special interest in the connections between slavery and the country house. She worked for the National Trust for nearly 20 years, based in Penrith Castle, where she was instrumental in challenging the way the trust interprets and prophecies connected to the empire of slavery. Uh, finally, uh, Audrey West. Audrey moved from North London to North Wales in November 2017 to pursue her creative interests. She felt that I felt this area of outstanding beauty reflected her birthplace within the Portland, Jamaica landscape and it tends to share this gift by offering artistic retreats. Following an AMA in cultural memory in 2002 and raised awareness of reverberations of trauma and subsequent generations of enslaved Africans, Africans who have suffered the onslaughts of transit legal slave chattel industry. Um, I'd like to begin with the first question tonight. Was, this is from Jill. Uh, to, to all of you, I think we begin with Chris. Was the Atlantic slave trade the first interest of de dehumanization of slaves? I think the short answer is yes. As people are well aware, systems of slavery have existed for a very long time, since antiquity. And you can find many mentions of enslavement in the, in the Old Testament. So slavery in itself 
is not a new phenomenon, but there are many systems of slavery that have existed historically, and not all of them mean that the enslaved person enjoys or suffers degraded status. There are a good number of variables where slavery might mean incorporation into a household unit, it could mean attachment for military service, it could mean any number of things. And historically, slavery has not had a particular racial dimension. That is a novelty of the Atlantic world, really. Um, so the dehumanization of slaves, the reduction of human beings to chattels, is to objects, that is, to commodities that can be exchanged with uh, no legal rights whatsoever and, and uh, no particular humanity allowed to them is an innovation of the Atlantic era, I would say. Okay. Uh, Maria? Yes, I would, I would agree with what Chris has said. And I think what we find most shocking is the way that it was dehumanized even more by the fact that it was done on such an industrial scale. The, the statistics that you gave us from the Slave Voyages website um, are particularly um, shocking when you actually read them. Um, and I think if we look at other forms of atrocity, um, such as, um, I don't know, Pol Pot, the Holocaust, things like that, they were aberrations. But when we look at what happened with the slave trade is that it lasted for something like 350 years and it was absolutely, totally legal. And it was supported by European countries, by the Crown, by the Parliament and by the law. Um, and I think that as far as dehumanizing goes, um, was absolutely, well, what can you say? It, it is the worst that you can possibly do to any, any human being and on such an industrial scale. And I think that is so shocking. Okay. Well, thank you, Mary. Audrey, <laughs> anything to add? I think um, the transatlantic slave, well, possibly began with the Portuguese um, in Madeira. And in that, at that point, they were using people for, for not, and not paying them, using their skills and labor for sugar production. Um, I'm very bad at dates, um, but this would have been um, mid um, 15th century, let's say. Um, and following the discovery, want of a better word, the um, invasion of other lands, um, the idea of sugar production took hold and it was a very precious commodity and the Spanish considered how to um, build on that commodity and they used the, um, Jamaica and other Caribbean islands to expand on that commodity and again used Africans because they could withstand the heat as people who worked for nothing because it also made the commodity more um, lucrative. Um, at that point, it wasn't chattel slavery, it was one of the forms of oppression. Um, as from, from, there was conflict within the, um, I suppose I'm talking about that aspect of it, because the conflict grew, the, um, the Spaniards and, for instance, Bartolome, Bartolome de las Casas, who was a Spanish monk, considered the pros and cons of how to keep this labor and what to give them rewards, also whether to make them Christians, whether not, you know, whether they had souls, whether they didn't. So there was a debate going on, which is um, a long debate. But from my reading and understanding, by the time the British came on board and other European nations, the, trans the transformation was, these people have no souls, we will make them things and in that way we can treat them as badly as they like, their lives do not matter and they are treated as animals and below and in that way we have total dominion over them and there was also the the gift of dominion given by the church and state and through that process possibly when they were also being traded because the trade also happened with African countries um, and possibly the people who sold or gave away these people were giving um, people who had been captured in war or other forms of slavery, as Chris has explained. Um, the chattel system was possibly not known to the Africans, possibly, but possibly through ignorance later on, they continued to send people on these voyages because there was also a financial tra transaction going on. 
So eventually these people became commodities to enable capitalism to flourish. That's my view. I agree. <laughs> uh, but thank, thank, thanks, you three, for that. Um, next question is for Ali. Are you going to get any really at Chris because it's, it's Chris's area of research? Uh, can you tell us a bit, a bit more about Canaberia and the relationship with slavery and woolen industry? Give this re reputation for radicalism and pacifism, Chris. Um, well, the, the place under discussion. How, how do you say it, Darren? I was going to say uh, Bryn Mawr. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, well, did, did I not say that? Sorry. <laughs> bull, bullseye. <laughs> I like it. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's, um, it's a place that lies on the boundary between the area of Mid Wales that produced webs, coarse cottons that were almost entirely intended for Caribbean markets, and the flannel production area to the to the south and the east, which had a far more varied kind of. Um, um, series of series of markets so it's a place that's deeply implicated in the trade that links mid wales with 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 the caribbean what implication that has for uh, traditions of welsh radicalism i wouldn't really like to say except to note as i did in our sort of formal session a couple of couple of saturdays, saturdays ago that the kind of place that was discovered by anthropologists and geographers in the early part of the 20th century and defined as a place of authentic Welshness was only a shadow of a place it had been 100 or 150 years earlier when it had been a thriving industrial district. I think you're looking at a, at a parish and a network of parishes in mid Wales that were depopulated, deindustrialized, demoralized, and those colleagues who are interested in the development of Welsh political and cultural traditions in the 19th and 20th centuries might want to take that context into account. But that's not that's not really my area of expertise. So I'll I'll hang back at that point and, and leave it to others. I, I suppose it depends what your your radicalism is as well, whether you think it mm -hmm. A middle class radicalism, or, or or if you've got any experience of, of or, or if you you separated from 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 your, what you're producing, do they have any any comprehension of 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 what their goods was producing in terms of you know the, the outcomes? Then so it's difficult to assess. Uh, Mar Marion Audrey, do you, do you, I know it's Chris's field, but any thoughts? Yes. Um... Taking about everything that Chris has, has said, there was one, there's one person especially who came out of um, Llanbryn Mair who was actually very radical. He was the, um, the, the minister, um, Samuel Roberts, he was always known as SR, uh, by the initials SR. He started a um, publication called uh, Chronicle, the, the Chronicle, and in that he wrote several um, anti-slavery um, articles for it, and he preached quite heavily um, throughout Wales and he actually went over to um, um, America because he wanted to set up a Welsh, as, as in Patagonia, a Welsh um, colony in, in Tennessee, but this didn't actually come about. He was actually accused of having uh, been given a plantation and owning slaves while he was over there, but whether that's actually true or not. But basically he wrote two anti-slavery poems that, that he, he published. These were based on, on English versions, so um, he wasn't the um, original author of them, but one was called um, Yamba's Sorrow, the Black Slave, and it's about a young slave girl called, called Yamba and how she's torn from her home and how she can never go back. Um, and then the other one um, is called The Cruelty of Beating Women. Um, now, he was quite a torn figure, as many of these people are, as, as much as he opposed um, slavery and he preached quite regularly from the chapels of Clambury Mayer and the outer, and the outer area. Um, he was also a pacifist and I think this links to the point um, I think raised in the in the question um, because when he was over in America it was beginning they lead up to the American um, uh, Civil War um, and even though he was totally against slavery he couldn't actually support the North because they wanted to fight the South. And so he was very much a contested figure. Um, but of course, one of the, um, the I think, Llanbryn Mair's um, other famous son is Yorweth Pete, 
who started Cross National Museum Wales and St Fagan, um, which links to the point that Chris was, was making about um, this sort of impoverished, um, noble and innocent craftsperson who had been more or less abandoned and ignored by the rest of the world, when in actual fact they were very much involved in, a, uh, in, in an international system of slavery. Fantastic. Just, just, just an, ad, an admin point with the chat. One, one thing, sorry for my pronunciation, Ali, because he shouted at me. Um, what, what we probably is best to do is to, to revisit the chat at the end. So, so rather than interrupting the, the flow of these questions, if we go back and revisit everything right at the end. Audrey, any, any, I know, again, it's just Chris, Chris more Chris and Marion's been, but any thoughts on that? Absolutely no contribution. Well, Thank you. Well, this, 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 this is. This is great because this leads us on to the new specialist subject. Um, um, this, this is from Peter. Rule Britannia was seen in the context of his time first performed for Frederick Prince of, Frederick Prince of Wales was support of the Navy and overseas expansion as opposed to his father, George II, who was more involved in Europe. Do, do you think that's correct? Uh, could, could you repeat that? Um, I think what, what Peter's saying is that the, the idea of being rule Britannia it was it was it was a more it was a, a kind of a bit of a political spark between Frederick, Prince of Wales, and his, his father George II, who was, was I think Frederick trying to promote the, the navy, and and I think uh, George what Peter said is George II was was looking at the expansion within Europe. You've you've done some work on rule Britannia. Would would would, would you think it, it was that or is that, is that not exactly your field? So, so if I'm putting you on the spot, do you? Um, do you know, I feel that um, uh, when I looked at the, the discussion last time, it was really what is it that caused the British expansion in the way it did, as well as then what continues into the present. Mm. And what, my, from my experience, there is very little review of what perpetuates the kind of oppressive practice within the British system that created some of the downsides of colonialism, some of the um, oppressions, well, not some of the oppressions because the details of the oppressions of slavery. And so when a song like Royal Britannia is perpetuated without questioning that whatever caused it to come about, that sort of part of, it's like building um, foundations and, it, and you remain in that calcified way and mm -hmm. my thoughts are you look you review a nation's movement possibly or you remain calcified and some of that stuff rots people and systems. No, I, 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 I agree and I suppose and, uh, and Andrew Chandler has come up with, with, with a follow-up question really that, that Aren't songs more capable of reinterpretation than statues? Could be going through a, a lot, lots of issues with statues. But I, I would tend to agree with you. But would, would you think they can be reinterpreted now? Or, or you know, it's very interesting talking about songs because I feel that I've come through, and I will say some of my background. I've come through a Pentecostal system where songs really embed us. Um, I will also. Um, say that I moved into, I became a Quaker at some point because there was no singing, even though I love songs. Um, so um, the thing with songs is they can build you up and they can also damage you because they get into your subconscious in a very deep way. And what the words do, they are um, implicit in, in, and subliminal. And as they create a narrative in you and in the other that you're often not conscious about. Now, I grew up within a system where we had to become conscious of the words. And I also have a poetic inclination because I listen to the sounds of words. And I reject a lot, for instance, a lot of the Christian songs because they really em embrace enslavement at a very deep level in terms of, you know, and probably Christians might not think that way. And similarly, the, the sort of, you know, so I respond personally to antagonistic songs at a personal level. So that's my own personal response. Um, other people might not feel that way. The music might be the thing that carries them, but the music does, I mean, the thing with songs is the music carries you 
but then you know it's it's then very questionable about what where the words go i agree uh, Marianne, any, any thoughts well, that's so powerful what yeah, yeah. Um, has, has just said anything yeah. that i can add to that will be quite feeble but i think the only thing i would add to it is looking at the chap who wrote it a, a chap called james thompson he wrote it in 1740 and he was a scot living most of his adult life in in london and he was very much for a unified britain and he wrote it as as a means by which welsh people scottish people and indeed at the time irish people even though the parliaments weren't unified until what 1800 1801 um but even so i think he he wrote that and i think when we're looking at it at a time that britain didn't rule the waves but you know he it was an exhortation for them to rule the waves then we have to look at it from the position of what it says about how he felt or where britain should be but i think linking directly to what audrey had said songs and words have consequences and yes it is a different time now and those words have consequences now i agree um chris uh, any thoughts on yourself and feel free to mention the the current ferrari around uh, our our prime minister and choose my words very carefully there well I'll, 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 okay i'll, I'll do <laughs> best um it, it it's absolutely right what um what Marion has just said, rural, rural Britannia comes out of a very particular context and it's about the Caribbean. It's, it, it's written at the moment, it's composed at the moment of aggressive British activity in the Caribbean against the Spanish Empire. It's, it's, a, it's kind of an anthem, if you like, of British naval expansionism. It reflects a mercantilist interest in, in the Sugar Islands in, in particular. And it, that always has to be borne in mind. It's also the case, um, as Audrey has suggested to us, that, that songs evolve over time and take on new meanings. And we've only got to look around the, 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 con the context in which we find ourselves today to realise that, that rule, rule Britannia is not being um, held up for reverence as some kind of uh, uh, you know, particularly magical piece of music or a piece of kind of poetry that everybody has in their hearts because no one can remember the words other than Britain <laughs> will be slaves. I mean, the rest of it is is completely forgotten. But now it's just reduced to something that we've bellowed out by chauvinists like Nigel Farage and his mini-me um, Boris Johnson. And, uh, you know, it's it started badly and it's degraded even worse. I don't know if it's, um, it's the right thing to do, give a round of applause, but if I could give a round of applause, I'd give a round of applause to that last statement. I, I, I couldn't agree with you anymore, Chris. <laughs> right, this, this is from uh, Andrew again. Uh, I think we, we, we touched on this extensively, so, so we can rehash things really for, the, for those people who didn't uh, or couldn't make the first session. I think um, what, what Andrew's saying is uh, the Bristol was a major Welsh port in the, in the 17th century, and he, he goes on to mention Coastal, but, but can, can, you can you explain the importance of Bristol to Wales and Wales to Bristol? And I suppose Marion could do perhaps do the same for Liverpool. Chris, do you want to start with Bristol? Yes, certainly. I think it's, I was probably about 50 years ago, possibly 60 years ago now, that uh, historian Walter Minchington published an essay called Bristol, and I think the subtitle was Capital of the West in the 18th century, and that pretty much sums it up, because Bristol is a port that draws upon a huge hinterland up the, up the Severn Valley, along the Avon Valley, into the, into the English Southwest, and of course takes in South Wales. So it's enormously important as a place of concentrated wealth and commercial activity that has a profound influence on what goes on through South Wales and the, and the, the, the Welsh borders at, at that time. So yes, Bristol is in some respects the capital of Wales in that time, or the capital of South Wales at that time. And I imagine, Marion, something analogous could be said about Liverpool. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. For um, for Liverpool initially, it was Chester, but of course, uh, after a while, the D started silting up. You could still get barges and what have you to Liverpool, but Liverpool became the, the, the biggest port. And of course, what you have there, you've got several things happening at the same time. You've got the burgeoning Industrial Revolution, you've got the places of the North Industrial Centres, Manchester, you know, the rest of Lancashire, what have you. And they're all taking their, their goods to Liverpool to be shipped out. And you see, I think I mentioned in my talk how you can consider Wales to be North Wales, and the reason why I was focusing on Liverpool, of course, because with my presentation, I was speaking about North Wales, not the whole of Wales, um, um, that North Wales could be seen as, as a hinterland of Liverpool in the fact that it provides so many of its raw materials and people um, to, um, to, to Liverpool. Um, and through that subsequently to the Atlantic slave trade. Um, many people, um, I think um, a few years ago, um, Gwyneth, um, art museum and a museum in Bangor, they did a wonderful, wonderful exhibition on the connections between um, North Wales and, and Liverpool. And it was so, so moving to see the, the letters, the personal memorabilia that people still have going back, some of them a couple of centuries, to families' connections that date to Liverpool. And of course, after a while, Liverpool came to dominate the slave trade. Thanks, Brian. Again, or do you, again, I know it's not your field really, but... Um, not really. I, I don't, I'm in a part of Wales at the moment that people think might have had a connection with slavery, but it's very uncertain exactly what happened um, in North Wales um, by the, where, where do I say, up by the estuary. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there are still uncertain grounds where, you know, where the connectors are, really. Um, but I'm not an expert on Wales, I will say. So no, 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 no problem. Um, we've got quite a, quite a few questions we've grouped together on, on religion now. So, no, but ask the first one. Um, do we, uh, can, can you describe any instances where missionaries were opposed to the slave trade and the colonisation in general? So, uh, uh, Marion? Oh, this is a huge, huge topic. I know. <laughs> um, absolutely. I know. Um, <laughs> now, of course, missionaries were very important, especially as far as going over to the, the Caribbean. And even though most of the missionary period was 19th century, so after, after slavery, they still did their part at the end of the 18th century. Um, but more than anything, I think we, we cannot separate the fact that missionaries, more than, uh, more than anything, their focus was evangelism evangelism first and slavery second. Um, they were also, um, uh, as far as the Caribbean was concerned, uh, very important for bringing back first hand reports, eyewitness reports. But of course, initially at the beginning when they were reporting on the cruelty and, and um, what they witnessed of slavery, they weren't believed because they were part of the propaganda um, machine. But bit by bit and the force of evidence that was coming through and so the, the missionary voice became very, very strong in, indeed. Um, but it's actually very interesting if you have a look at the various denominations that were going out, because they were Anglican missionaries, but on the whole, most of them are nonconformist. And um, so it all depends whether they were Baptist, Baptist, very important. Um, they were uh, many, many Baptist missionaries, but you find it's whether they were going out there for their own personal redemption because if they were Arminian, the, you know, the what we would call, I suppose, Wesleyan, um, where they believed that everybody could be saved dependent upon your good works. Whereas if you were of a more Calvinistic, then it was only the elector could be saved, or it didn't really matter what you did. And so, uh, it so you, you need to understand what denomination was to understand the purposes of why they were going out there, and of course, um. After, by the time you move into the 19th century, into the early, uh, the gap between end of slavery, a uh, slave trade and slavery itself, then you've got many missionaries who, who seem to think it's like a gift to Africans where they're going in and they see it as a second emancipation. So giving them Christianity. So not only are they taking, are Europeans taking their their, their freedoms away from them, but they're also taking their culture and their religions away from them as, as well. So, so yes, um, missionaries did a lot of very important work in progressing abolition, but it was very much on their own terms. Thanks, very comprehensive answer, thank you, Maria. Audrey? I'm a bit conflicted because 
Um, when you say missionaries, um, I think of, for instance, in Jamaica of the Baptists who were on the whole mostly well behaved in terms of looking out for the souls of the, the slaves and the newly freed slaves in Jamaica. And I will say that I was in, inclined to align myself with Quakers and then discovered how in, embroiled they were in slavery for hundreds of years, um, from Barbados to um, up to um, Clarkson's work in helping the emancipation progress. Because it was about 200 years when it would come to yearly meeting on, a, on an annual basis of the concern for a few Quakers about slavery and they would get drummed out of meeting. And these things are in Quaker catalogues. Um, and that history is kept quiet, silent, because that is often what we do with unsavory parts of our history. Um, and it's not to say that Quakers did not do some sterling work towards helping people towards emancipation, but every, it was, to me, I see it as a sort of, um, on, I'm using this group because I know a bit more about them, but I see it as a way of, for instance, a bit like animal rights at the moment. People feel a bit guilty for eating animals, some of them. Some of them think it's fine, this is what they're there for, and others will think this is atrocious. And as things move on, perhaps people will have a different view of what we concern, consider to be the norm. So to me, that enslavement was the norm in terms of people's way of being. And if you challenged that, you were an outsider. Um, and, you know, the church was conflicted like many other people because other individuals within the system thought this is wrong and felt very strongly about it being wrong. And some people, as Marion says, went out to really save souls and to protect them and so on. But when, I, when you say missionaries, the church is also very diverse and where do you stop and start in terms of what did people bring and what did people take away? So I would go, I could go on ad infinitum. And <laughs> <laughs> that, that reflects the questions as well. I think that, that Norbert's opening question about missionaries is reflecting three or four different questions about different, different groupings within that, within that, you know, um, the different, uh, different groupings of Christianity. So, you, so yeah, you, you both, you both uh, really tell you with, with the questions and, and asking. Chris? Well, I think we've just had two very compelling contributions on this on the subject, so I'm happy to happy to leave it there. I can add, I can add nothing of value. Can I just add one point on that, Dan, if, if if you don't mind, Dan? Um, looking, thinking of the Quaker history, um, that um, Audrey is absolutely right, and I noticed that um, in the comments as well about um, the slave ownership of Quakers in something like 1705. So it's estimated that 70 percent of Quakers owned slaves which is absolutely ridiculous, but they had cut that. Um, so only 10% did of them within 50 years. But an interesting thing that one of the transatlantic slave ships that plied the Atlantic carrying slaves was actually called the Willing Quaker. I think that was uh, named by somebody who had a deep knowledge of Quakerism at that time. Uh, just, to, just to finish on, on this section, so Andrew Chan has asked about Historic views of Calvinistic Methodists in Wales toward, towards slavery? Calvinistic Method, of course, they didn't come in until much later. I think as a name, they, they weren't actually formed until 1801. So while slavery, right, uh, yeah. you know, but just towards the very end mm. of, of, of that period. And certainly at the end of the 18th century, they were probably too busy arguing with each other about <laughs> what form they, they, they should take, you know. <laughs> As we know, you know, most villages have two Calvinistic Methodist churches within them <laughs> so they can argue with each other. Um, but it's the same with all denominations. The, when Calvinistic Methodists were first set up, they were as you know, they were, I suppose, the, the Presbyterians, they, they call themselves the Presbyterians now. Um, they were very much, they didn't want to break away from the, um, I suppose, the established church. It was only as a last minute thing that they actually did. And they were very much state, country, um, Tory, uh, uh, a lot of them. So I don't, they would have said slavery was bad, but I don't think they would have organised that much. We know that John Elias did go to speak in, in, in Liverpool. Um, but within that, 
um, I don't think they weren't as radical, that the radicalism within, within Calvinistic Methodism didn't really come until about the 1850s, when nonconformism becomes really um, radical within Wales. Yeah, again, superbly comprehensive answer. Uh, this is from Ian again. Uh, why do the trajectories of white indentured servants and black slaves diverge so much, so sharply in the mid 17th century? Um, Ian's actually suggested the answer is racial, racial categorizing developing. I, I kind of harks back to the first question, perhaps, but does anybody want to expand on that? Yeah. I'll, um, Thanks, Chris. The, the difference is um, white servants had a choice. And if you look at the development of an island like Barbados, which was the kind of epicenter of English colonialism in the in the mid 17th century, the original kind of demographic makeup of Barbados is of small planters and white servants. The problem was that um, white servants mm, had a choice where they could go and conditions on Barbados were so unpleasant, so savage, the labour regime was so intense um, word got around and it became increasingly difficult to recruit white servants. Moreover, the planters picked up upon the fact that although white servants had legal rights and could appeal to a magistrate if those rights weren't respected, there was increasingly a supply of black Africans who had no legal rights and could be brutalised without end. So the planters took the choice we're not going to bother with people who are reluctant to come here are getting more difficult to entice out. We're going to resort to coerced labour. And there is in mid 17th century Barbados, a dramatic bifurcation between um, white servant, servants who pretty much disappear and black Africans who pour in by the thousands every, every year, completely transforming the island in the course of the so-called sugar revolution. So, yeah, it's quite right. There is there is a there is a vast difference between the experience of the enslaved and the experience of the indentured, and that reflects the level of choice, and that reflects the kind of racial background and the, the nature of slavery. Thanks, Chris. Again, very comprehensive. Anybody like to add anything to that? I would absolutely agree with what Chris has said. And also, if you think that those who were selling themselves into in the period of, of indenture, they tended to be the poorest, who tended to be malnourished, weak, whereas the, the Africans that they were bringing over, even though it was a traumatic journey, they were, by far, they were younger and far healthier. And so inevitably they were going to be, as far as the planters were concerned, um, better workers, for, for them. And the point that Chris was made, once news got out, they did not want to go certainly to, to the Caribbean and, and after a while not even to um, America. They went over under different systems. But if you have a look at the legislation that started separating, then you had far different legislation for indentured servants. They had different clothes. Everything was very different. And yes, they were treated cruelly, people did die. Some of them did die before the end of their indentureship, but most survived. They could marry, their children were, were free. So it was very, very different and very racialized. Um, I just want to add that there is a white underclass still in Barbados that came up through this group. Um, <laughs> very much on the margins, but seen as very much an underclass. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks for that, Audrey. Um, but talking about uh, looking at the black experience in Wales now, our historic black experience in Wales, uh, Diane and Peter both, both mentioned Nathaniel Wells. Uh, Nathaniel Wells was, was uh, the son, um, son, son of a, a white trader and uh, a black slave. He, he was appointed Justice of Peace in 1803 and sheriff of Monmouthshire in 1818. Uh, died at the age of 72 in 1852. Looking at Nat Nathaniel's experience and also the early experience of, of black Georgians, is there a, can we gain a more rounded uh, idea of, of a black experience within Britain or within Wales? 
Marian? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. Marian. Literally, I was posing. Um, yeah, no, pick one of us. Um, um, as long as you had money, you were fine. I think we've talking, we've spoken about racialism, but have you? But basically, if you were rich, then you were powerful. And you know, I think we were discussing last time that the African traders they were very rich. There was no um, racial element regarding there. They were just business people, and you can see that in in Britain, Nathaniel Wells. He went to the best schools. He, he you know, uh, um, as you say, he he rose through the ranks of civil society. But if you have a look at others as well, I mean, I'm thinking of people such as. Um, says our Picton, he was um, John Phillips's um, black servant. He's brought over as, as a young boy. Um, this is of Picton Castle in Haverford West. Um, although he spent most of his time living in, in Surrey. He was, you know, as was typical of the time, a pretty black boy serving tea for a while. But of course, during the time that he was growing up there, he was able to get he was able to pick up the manners of the elite. He was able to pick up a massive contact list. He get he 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 had tips. He had all sorts of um, advantages. And then when he got older, um, he was um, given um, some money by the Phillips family, and he set himself up as a and he became a very wealthy coal merchant in Kingston on on Thames. In, in Surrey. So, you know, this shows that we, we, we tend to think that every black person in Wales was a, a, a slave, but they, they, they certainly were, were not. And many of them, as long as they had proper backing, did very, very well indeed. Um, another one, Jack Stimflin of, uh, by, by Puselli, he was brought over by one of the Williams Wind, um, um, of the, you know, the, of the Winstay family. Um, and he, he, um, was brought up on the Estimflin estate as a groundsman. He married locally. He was able to, he ran off with his bride, and yet he was able to go back to work on the estate. Um, and his children, uh, we presume his descendants are still in, in the area now, um, but his, his children went on to um, take very good positions within the local stately homes in, in the area. And for example, um, the Morgans of Jadiga. Um, had a black groom and certainly from the records there um, the livery for, for this black groom was 500 pounds then so this that's thousands of pounds now which shows the the gear that this groom was dressed in and he was also all the ones that I've been um, that I've mentioned all received a wage you know the records are there within the the archives of 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 these these properties so um yes the black presence was was here it wasn't very much but it certainly was was here it was noticeable and many of them were doing very well indeed right, thanks marian um or, or do you anything to add to that no i don't thank you oh, so, so, <laughs> sorry i've got to ask no, <laughs> chris well, I think what we do need to remember is that the Caribbean and the British Isles were linked by a very busy, busy traffic. And that meant that in major port cities, there was always a substantial population of, of African descent. Um, in London, in Liverpool, in, in Bristol, it was not an unusual thing at all to see people of, uh, of, uh, of, of dark, dark skin. So that black presence is of long standing. When it comes to people like Nathaniel Wells, there are complexities, of course, and the complexity arises from the fact his father was a planter. And if you were in the West Indies as a white man, as a planter or a overseer, essentially you had a license to rape. And that was, that was a license that was exercised very regularly so there is a substantial population of um of people of of mixed uh, of mixed ancestry who are the product of product of white white rape wells was the son as we as we know of a, of a planter and a enslaved woman he had the great advantage as man has pointed out of being prodigiously rich and one of the ironies is of course he was prodigiously rich because he owned slaves and we, we know precisely how many he did own because his estate is um, intact in, 18, in the 1830s when British um, emancipation takes place. 
and he is compensated for the slaves that he owns. So we're looking at layer upon layer of complexity and, and irony here in this situation. Well, th th thanks again, Chris. That's just, um, fantastic. I, I, another pretty open question. Um, the Royal Navy's role in the abolition of slave trade. Uh, do, do, you, do you want to kick us off again with that, Chris? Or Oh, okay. I'm, 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 I'm happy to. I, I see that uh, that Andrew Neil has made a complete jackass of himself on Twitter today by saying that you know we should respect Royal Britannia because it was the British Navy that uh, abolished the, the slave trade. Well, the answer to that is up to a point, um, not to a, to a very limited point indeed. The important part of the Royal Navy's history is the previous 150 years where it was instrumental in protecting slavery and ensuring the con continuity of slavery in the West Indies and, and British, North, British North America. After 1807, the British Navy does start to take another track, and that is to impede slave transports across the, across the Atlantic. And the British Navy does this for strategic reasons that are in the interests of the British state. Its primary purpose is to intercept the traffic of other nations, i.e. to strangle the, um, the, the operations of other rival national um, um, slave economies in the, Car in the Caribbean and, and in South America. So the interests of the British state are very rarely those that have interests of enslaved Africans at heart. And we can tell this because if you can, if you take a look at what happens to those who are liberated by the British Navy in the, in the 19th century, they take a number of routes. And during the early years of, of British naval action against the transatlantic slave trade, the slaves who were liberated from those ships, the men anyway, were not given any choice as to what they were gonna do. They were forcibly recruited into the British Army. And if you then trundle forward a couple of decades into the 1830s at the time of emancipation in the British Caribbean, those male slaves and female slaves who, who were liberated from um, illegal slave, sh slave ships were not returned to where they had come from. They were sent to the West Indies to work for a compulsory period of time for seven years as indentured labourers. So the idea that the British Navy was embarked upon a hum essentially humanitarian mission has to be taken with a gigantic pinch of salt. Uh, Maria? Uh, yeah, Chris has said it all. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Audrey, would you agree Chris pretty much covered that? Absolutely, that, that speaks a true historian. <laughs> <laughs> First time um, ever, people. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not at all. I think in, in, the, in the chat, Andrew Chandler suggests we, we read Britain's War Against the Slave Trade Operation of the Royal Navy, West African Squadron, 1807 to 1867, at D. Sullivan's uh, recent book. So I'm sure that that would offer some balance to, to Chris's opinion, no, no, no doubt. Although I know which side of the fence I, I, I sit on there. Um, Jean's asking, uh, and we covered this in, in some detail um, in in the Q and A we did manage uh, last time. It, does economics do it all again? Uh, would would you say the slavery was ended because it was economic? And economic, sorry. Marian, sorry. <laughs> right, well, um, slavery was, as we know, incredibly um, profitable for Britain, not just because of the plantations in Jamaica and, and the rest of the Caribbean and the American colonies while Britain still owned them, but because of the system that supported it, the manufacturing, the banking, the insuring, the shipping, it was everything else that provided the, um, the, the capital. Now, that means capital, as we know, is very fluid. It will take the easiest route to wherever it can get more capital. And you find that when the debate to end slavery starts rearing its ugly head, as far as the investors are concerned, um, you can see that money, like water, starts finding ways elsewhere. And you see that maybe it was unprofitable because people started pulling their money out, or, you know, but inevitably it started the abolition 
um, debate started a chain of events that basically led it to be unprofitable as money started. I mean, you can see, you know, troughs and, and rises in, in the fortunes of the um, um, production of, of, of sugar and other slave produced goods in, in, in the Caribbean. But once you find that the abolitionist movement really takes off, then you can see money going to, it goes to India, it goes elsewhere to the East, and it goes to huge investments within Britain itself into the um, Industrial Revolution and, and the infrastructure. So really, if you have a look, it was more to do with capital being pulled out of it. Plus, of course, you've got the um, destruction of, of the plantation systems. So that in itself made, made the plantation system un unprofitable. Uh, anything to add to that, Chris? No, I would, I would, uh, I would stand with with Marion there. I would add just one thing that we need to consider, which is the role, not so much of capital being withdrawn from the Caribbean. We need to consider also the issue of of slave resistance and the extent to which the enslaved themselves brought the um, the system of slavery to an end. In the early 19th century, there are a sequence of slave rebellions in, in the Caribbean that really pose huge questions about the viability of, of, of the system. Rebellions in, in Barbados, in, um, in, in modern day Guyana, in Jamaica in, in, 18, in 1831. So there are a sequence of explosions of, of resistance that really um, undermine the, the, the credibility of slavery as a system that had a future. Yeah, Audrey, Audrey? I would say that, I mean, I was, um, just to let you know that I am not, I've looked at history, but not from... No, no, I did, to totally understand you come from a, a different okay, perspective, and, right, and, and, and that's really well done. <laughs> in, in my, uh, for instance, America Williams um, wrote Capitalism and Slavery and showed that it was no longer profitable um, for the trade, trading of slaves was no longer pr profitable to the industry, whether they were paid or not. Um, and Marion and Chris will know the detail of that. Um, and also I agree with, for instance, the, um, the Haitian Revolution and, uh, you know, following the, um, the French Revolution, what happened in Haiti, people became afraid that this would happen across the Caribbean. And there were already a lot of slave uprisings again. So it all became a bit unsustainable from lots of um, angles. Um, and so added to what Chris and Marion has said, this was really no longer viable. There was also the industrial revolution that needed um, propping up with other forms of money. So, the, you know, the world was changing um, around the issue of slavery. Oh, okay. Yeah, th th thanks for that. Thanks for that, Audrey. Uh, we'll just lead, lead just, lead just nice to Nor Norbert's next question. Um, could, could we take this opportunity to understand is, actually the slaves agency which Chris has just mentioned and Audrey's mentioned as well in freeing themselves and look at slave resistance in the Congo Kingdom amongst others and I uh, expand a little bit more on 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 the revolution in um, Haiti. Chris, sorry. <laughs> sorry Dan, what was the question exactly that we, we left from the left from the Congo to Haiti there at one. I think it's, it's slave agency in freeing themselves, which you mentioned, but slave resistance, um, the, 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 in the Congo Kingdom and then also in Haiti late, late, later. Then. So, so slave, res, slave, slave resistance then. Yeah. Okay. Let, I, I understand now that the question is really about slave resistance, African agency. And that's a, that's a really fascinating issue if we look at patterns of enslavement within the wider Atlantic world um, to go to the Congo for, for example for a very long period in the 16th and 17th centuries the the Congo doesn't really contribute anything into the Atlantic slave system but from the second half of the 17th century the Congo and West Central Africa in general starts to be a very big contributor to the to the, the trafficking of people across across the ocean and the reasons for that are to, are to do with political stability when the kingdom of the congo collapses into civil war in, in the second half of the 17th century all of a sudden there's an oversupply of of prisoners of war and that's what stimulates um a slave trade so we have to look at african conditions 
to understand what's going on in the wider world as well as European um, uh, European descended demand in the in the new world. With respect to, to slave resistance, I would also think in terms not just of what's going on in the Caribbean, in terms of the Haitian Revolution, which is an absolutely monumental event, and all the kind of in, uh, uh, rebellions that have inspired in the decades that followed, but also to events in, in Africa. If we're looking for some of the reasons why the Atlantic slave system eventually perishes, we need to look as well into African resistance to slavery within, within Africa. And if you start to look at West Africa in the 1810s, the 1820s, the 1830s, there's a sequence of rebellions against predatory local political regimes that benefit from slavery. Very often these, these um, rebellions take the forms take the form of uh, jihadist uprisings, uprisings against the corrupt ruling class that's involved in systematic slave, slave trading. And for that reason, when we're looking at reasons for the demise of slavery, we need to factor in African agents, agency in that respect, not just in the diaspora, but in Africa itself. Excellent, excellent. Marian? Yeah, that was that was absolutely brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. Regarding Haiti, um, what it showed was that Africans could fight for their own freedom. I think it was incredibly symbolic what happened mm -hmm. and news spread around the rest of the Caribbean. Everybody knew about it. it that meant that as a backlash, um, a lot of European countries became even harsher in their treatments than they were quelling every possible rebellion they possibly could in case it became another Haiti but what it did show was that I think if you have a look at what Toussaint Louverture was doing he took what had been just a popular you know uprising and he turned it into an absolute revolution um, regarding what that actually meant it meant that for the first time we brought about a I suppose a Caribbean humanism where where people were equal and if you think that this was the time of Thomas Paine's you know rights of man then it's possibly that the first time that you had in the Caribbean um, a society that did offer equality um, to everybody and it was the first time that you actually had people there um, who were free and equal and it showed more than anything that you could actually live without colonial rule and you could fight for it and you could get it. Uh, again, superbly comprehensive. Audrey? Just want to add to that, that Haiti is still paying the price for freedom. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I understand, agree that your poorest country in the Western Hemisphere finished paying France reparations in 1947. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we could go into, <laughs> into the reverse reparations uh, and, and I could, we could be here for quite a long time talking about that. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, I, I still paying the price. And that's, I think that's, that's a really, really important point, Audrey. Uh, right, moving on. Um, as we confront, this is from, from Jean, as we confront the past in slave trade, how many African states are doing the same thing? Um, she's thinking about African kings and leaders of tribes who actually captured, imprisoned, sold men, women and children to rival tribes and traders in Britain and France. She, she's pointing to um, Benin, which, which has actually um, started to address this. Can you think of any other instances where, where African countries addressing the kind of issues that are being addressed in, in Britain at the moment with Colston and Picton. Are there any African instances of this that you're aware of? Uh, Audrey? I am not aware of any, I will say. I mean, historically, I, I don't know because I, I kind of think back to Nkrumah and some of the apologies and the way Africa was moving forward in the 50s and 60s and I don't know where they are in, as a I mean the, the problem with saying Africa yeah yeah I yeah. sort of hesitate yeah, as yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's just so it, there are so many countries on that continent mm. with so many different histories um, and I will say I'm not an expert on Africa. No, 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 no. I think what Jean's getting at then is that the Benin has actually addressed that issue. Um, 
just are, are there if if Chris or Marion can think of any other instances they've come across where where uh, a non-European country has addressed that type of issue, Marion? I was I was lucky enough a few years ago to spend six days in Hamburg at, at a conference where there were several people from Ghana there and um it was it was fascinating um the head of the history department for um ghana university was then he was saying in his younger days that he'd been on the board that wrote the curriculum for schools and he was active in ensuring that um, african complicity in slavery was excluded from the curriculum it just wasn't taught at all this was all innocent africa all nasty white europeans but over the the um, subsequent years, um, he has been instrumental in flipping that that around, and he was actually ensuring that it was embedded within the school curriculum that um, African um, complicity was um, was a part of of the curriculum for every every child in Ghana. But he was explaining some of the issues that they that they have there. We think of Ghana, we think of Nigeria, but within Ghana, he's saying you have over a hundred different language groups. In Nigeria, you've got over 400 different language groups. And he was saying that, saying as far as Ghana is concerned, trying to get them to think of themselves as Ghanaians is difficult enough, never mind trying to think of themselves as having some form of unified identity when they can think of slavery, especially when, especially in the north of the country, slavery is still endemic, especially child slavery. Um, and he was saying that certainly as far as some of the names of uh, fa families are, you can tell by somebody's name whether they are descended of a, from a slave or, or not, and automatically that affects how you are treated within society as a whole. And those who descend from, from um, enslaved people will, will find it very difficult actually getting to that if there is a glass, a glass ceiling. So they face many, many problems, not just being able to face up to um, complicity in, in the European slave trade. But they, they, they are doing, and especially it's not the history department, There's a, they have a lot of problems within the history department with confronting this history. It's the theology department that is moving forward um, on, on this. So he was um, discussing the various battles that, that he was having. But one thing they are doing um, is discussing the way, not only that it was a westward trade but also a northward and an eastward trade as well in dealing with um, North Africans, the Moors, the Arabs, you know, um, for their, their, their slave trade and they did actually, um, they published this, this book, I don't know if you can see, see that, but this actually is on the, the slave routes that go north out of Ghana um, Trans-Saharan rather than Trans-Atlantic. So Ghana within very difficult circumstances um, is, is actually trying to do its best on, on, on this. But Chris, let's slightly reframe in that. Um, hopefully Britain or uh, the UK is starting to address some, some of these issues with, with the removal of statues and we'll start to have this discourse. Are you aware of this similar kind of discourse in, in other European countries, Spain, Portugal? You know, are, are they addressing, addressing things in a similar way or? Spain and Portugal, I don't know much about. I'd, I'd, I'd sort of defer to, to Audrey here as expertise in those areas. I suspect Portugal is, uh, has a very hard time acknowledging colonial, colonial past. Um, France, on the other hand, there are signs of movement, particularly in Nantes, which was one of the main slave imports in the, in the 18th century, the principal slave import in France. And then there now is, although well, I haven't been able to, to visit it, a major memorial to uh, uh, the, the, the French role in transatlantic slavery and to the, um, the emancipation of uh, the diaspora in the French colonies. Oh, that, thanks, Chris. Um, Audrey? I will say that, let me see, I was in Portugal in 1976 um, uh, and I was told Lisbon was a beautiful city and I, it was a city of devastation because the, Port the Angolan Mo and Mozambique revolution were both happening and all the statues were defaced. The city was in turmoil. There was, you know, it was actually a city in decay because of those revolutions. And I have 
not really visited Lisbon. That's been a long time. But when I've spoken to some black Portuguese people, they say that Portugal has um, started to embed and address racism within the system. And so I don't, I've not lived there, so I can't testify, but other people who are black will say that's begun and they're acknowledging racism and looking at equalities. That's all I can say in terms of what other people tell me. But at the time, it was, it was quite interesting in terms of all the statues were defaced and the whole colonial history was in upheaval. Very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> the next question is quite specific. It's from, from Dewi. Would you, would you encourage us to consider slavery in a sense of focusing on a victim aggression or more talk about implication? Like De Dewey's referring to Michael Rothenberg's work, which I haven't read, The Implicated Subject. Has, there, has anybody yet read that? Or I'll be honest with you, I have, I have to have got a lot of experience. I'll say that I have. So would you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Um, uh, would, this is from Dewey Old. De would you encourage us to consider slavery in the sense of focusing on a victim aggression, victim slash aggression, or more talk about implication? I, can I say, um, yeah, of course. Yeah. I would, part of my concern is, I came, became aware of the lasting impacts, post-trauma impacts of slavery when I was looking at um, the Holocaust and post-trauma affecting Holocaust generations. Um, and what happened with enslavement is that neither the victims nor perpetrators really talked about the experience after it happened. When I say talk, I mean in, the, in Jamaica there were lots of uprisings because they were very badly treated and then they were quelled very viciously. Um, I have not lived in Jamaica for a long time. I've lived in the UK for most of my life and I've also went to a liberal school and liberal communities where we addressed racism as best as we could, even though we're in a system that systematically was racist. That wasn't my dominant um, consciousness. So, and I managed to do it, for instance, I'd be in Latin American studies and not see myself as an enslaved person. So that tells you quite a lot about how the subconscious operates. Now, when I became aware of how much we do not talk about enslavement, because I had no idea about my own past in slavery. I asked my other school friends, did your, your parents speak to you about slavery? Oh no, absolutely not. None of us had that consciousness of enslavement. We'd see the um, Kunta Kinte and think that was out there. Nothing to do with us. I don't know, <laughs> you know, um, roots. Um, so there needs to be, since the develop, that was in two, two, the year 2000, when I became more conscious of the impact of post-trauma because our behavior as a group shows that we're not progressing as a group, that we're also being oppressed by a dominant system. And particularly in the UK, it's very hard to address a system because it's very much underground. The violence is emotional and intellectual and mental. Um, whereas in the States, it's a physical violence that you can see daily. In the UK, it's, it's very hard to grasp what is the underlying um, aggression. And so very difficult to name it. And there've been, since I've been here, there've been lots of commissions, lots of um, things put in place to address racism. But actually we're back to square one with our prime minister, for instance, who say, let's forget all that. Nothing to do with us. Um, sorry, no, you know, that's one. But my thoughts on this is that we do need both the people who are victims, for want of a better word, and the oppressors, for another better word. We both need to look at the past. Judith Herman is somebody who is, whose book, Trauma and Recovery, I find very interesting because she says until the... Um, until the oppressors, for the word, recognize the suffering of the victims, they will, the system creates both this, uh, comfort for both groups. And once they see that there is some mourning from the victims, then there'll be some intervention. And my thoughts are currently that we're observing the mourning of some victims at the moment, which is why there's been a coalescence across the globe of this oppression. So that is my hope that we'll recognize the mourning, we'll recognize the damage, 
And I think part of what we're now resurging is a um, cultural memory in both the oppressors as well as the victim to say, this is my experience, this is a collective experience, how can we change it? And that's where I'm a bit optimistic because not until you do the truth and reconciliation can you move towards the healing. And so let's hope we remain truthful towards what happened in the past so that we can move towards reconciliation. It's a superb answer. Chris, good luck. Well, no, no I'm, I've, I've nothing to, to add on top of that. But, uh, uh, it'd be superfluous and impertinent of me to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely superb. Right, we, we, I've got one more question from, from last time, which I'll ask right at the end. So if we, if we go to, to tonight's chat, which uh, we've, we've got... We could be on time and a half, as my, my dad used to say, because there's 20 questions to answer. So we could, we could be here for quite a while. Um, uh, Marnie, can, can you, can you um, expand on Brimbo's uh, experience with slavery? Um, I think basically just summing up what I said in, in my presentation was the fact that um, um, Brimbo, well, it, initially it was Bersham, but then, but then Brimbo as a um, steelworks, it was um, bought, Brimbo especially was bought, um, Bersham was owned by jo uh, John Wilkinson's father and he took it over from, from him. But when he needed to expand, he bought Brimbo as the steelworks and the, the, the foundry. Um, the ironwork set up by John Wilkinson was used um, to forge cannon for the um, the Navy and for the East India Company. He was working with Anthony Bacon down in Kavartha, um on, on, on um, designing a, you know, quite a revolutionary method of building cannon. And he also at, um, at Wrexham, he was producing rollers, cane crushers that were sent out to the Caribbean for the sugar plantations there. Um, and also John Wilkinson was heavily invested in the copper industry in partnership with um, Thomas Williams of Paris Mountain and Hollywell and Swansea and Lancashire and, and elsewhere. And he, he, um, um, his wealth became even greater through his involvement in that in controlling the copper industry and making sure that they um, held the monopoly, especially against the Cornishmen. Uh, we've got a couple of comments about the uh, rule Britannia. So uh, mm -hmm. we've, uh, I think we've quite extensively covered covered that. Um, also, does anybody want to comment on Land of Hope and Glory? Said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much my comment on that as well. Um, Neil mentions Metropolis of the West, published more than seventy years ago. Um, I just run through. My mistake. So sorry, sorry. You've been told. <laughs> um, and just, just reading through the question. Um, does anyone who comment that Britain was built on the backs and souls of slaves? And that this, this is a personal comment to me. Uh, and the UK owes a debt to the descendant of, of enslaved people. We did touch on this, but the idea of reparations, that's, that's a thorny subject. I, I know, what, what, what's your opinions on that? If we, if we start with, with Audrey? I think I've more or less talked about reparations in the sense of actually acknowledging what has happened. Mm. Then that is a start of saying, we did harm as a group to another group of people, which is massive in the sense of who the we is. It's not us in this current generation who did it. And some of us are not the current generation who experienced it. But in my view, both the impact of what happened in the past impacts on people in the future, just like I was talking about the songs. So if we can collectively say, we will take responsibility for the legacy of the past so that we can move towards a future, then we can do that together. I don't know if I've answered your question, but that, and that's a beginning of reparation. Then once we recognise the legacy, then we can see how do we repair so that both communities can move towards the future in a healthy way. And my thoughts about reparation is all about repair of damage. 
and they could be legal or they could be financial or they can be educational but they are there for both groups to recognize how do we repair this damage that's been done I mean it's not just for I mean there are lots of damages that have been done through the process of capitalism and lots of people want their sort of peace um, but this particular the way that Africa as a country has been damaged through slavery and colonialism is major in terms of global economics and global well-being. Um, and we need to address that because um, the UK is one of the key sources of that damage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, reparations, Maria? Right. Oh, my goodness. Following Audrey is always difficult. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> so many powerful. I've got, I've got to do it all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but certainly, um, I, when I was in Jamaica, going around schools, going around, um, you know, the former plantations, going into the archives and the, and the libraries, I was asking people what, what Britain could actually do. And I was very surprised at the answers that I was getting. And it wasn't demands for, for money, although of course that, that's important and could be a part of it. I'm not touching that. But certainly what they were asking for was knowledge, information, access to two things. You know, the Jamaica, I'm talking specifically of Jamaica, but it could apply to, to other um, colonies as well, especially through absent, absentee landowners there who around about the 1730s left Jamaica and other places in the hands of agents. But basically they stripped the country of, of the profits, which meant that the investments and the riches were spent in Britain, not in the, in, in the, in the colonies. And so they don't have the things that for example, that you see in North America. Um, but what they were asking for, they were things like the digitization of our slavery records because their students can't research their own history. Mm. And they may be to have some placements, preferred placements in universities over here. I've been trying to get the um, Bangor University collection of the Penrin, um, Pennant collection digitized um, that that is my absolute dream because then students can access that information no matter where they are in 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 the world regarding the point that um, Audrey has made several times and I think it's absolutely right we need to acknowledge and we need to learn and we need to acknowledge and work together on on this um, I'm sure um, some of you are familiar with the book if you haven't read it I can't I can't remember she's a, um, um, an academic and it's learning from the Germans and it's how the Germans have been able to move forward um, with dealing with Nazi atrocities. And she compares that with how um, plantations in America can actually come to terms with their past history as, as well. I mentioned um, a few minutes ago the conference in Hamburg where I met the head of history at the University of Ghana. That conference was focused on how Ghana can be open about its complicity to the slave trade, but also how Germany could teach its students Nazi atrocities, no matter what their background. And what, what came out of that was this, this peace and reconciliation, the talking, the bringing the groups together so that you, you cannot do it by polarizing people. You have to do it by bringing people together through understanding and know, knowing the history. Yeah, superbly put again. Chris, reparations? Um, no, I'm, I don't want to add anything to what Marion has said, I think, yeah. and, and what Audrey has said. I think those are two very powerful, powerful con contributions. It's a question of accepting responsibility, isn't it? Uh, yeah. uh, that's what it comes down to. I, I like to apologise to the three of you every time I come to you last as well, because you're all so good. <laughs> Where has last? I'm afraid Frank hasn't got a lot to say, so thanks for that. Um, we, we've spoken about the longevity of the slave trade. How, how much, apart from abolition right at the end, how much opposition was there to, to, to slavery throughout the duration of, 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 of the Atlantic slave trade? Um, Chris, as you were last last night. Um, well, it was it was continuous um, from the very outset. People were trying to run away, were trying to escape, were resisting, and that is why Latin America, in particular, sort of large areas of Brazil or, or Colombia, are 
uh, studied with settlements that originated as havens for runaway slaves, palenques in, in, in Spanish, very, very common. Um, so resistance is there from the very outset. It's just something that is, you know, very forbidding. It requires huge amounts of courage to, to, to get, you know, to go, to go through with it because the penalties are, are, are so severe. But resistance is a thread from start to finish with, with Atlantic slavery. So that means hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, Maria? Yes, absolutely. And even opposition to slavery within white culture as well, as, as we know from the very first, I think we discussed this during our, our session a, a couple of weeks ago, the very first slave voyage recorded, something like 1441 or 1443, um, there were people in Portugal who were recognising the, the, the utter horror of what they were doing in, in moving people around and forcing them into enslavement and of course we have the, the Jesuits even though the Jesuits themselves owned slaves and sold slaves as well and the, the Quakers as well we've already discussed those um, and if we look at how the abolitionist movement I know Chris has discussed absolutely the um, the opposition within the enslaved themselves and then as we know from your very first statement Dan, there were millions of, of those but if we have a look at the abolition of slavery uh, sorry, the compensation paid to 47,000 owners of enslaved people. Um, if you have a look at how many people signed petitions to abolish slavery during the abolitionist period, one and a half million signatures were collected, one and a half million signatures. There was opposition throughout the period of slavery and far more people but of course you know out of sight out of mind to a certain extent there are still people buying um, goods produced by enslaved people but regarding the moral aspect of it yes um, continuously opposed. Um, Audrey? I imagine nobody wanted to remain a slave um, and so in, in, but I kind of think there's a, back to what I said earlier about, there's something about accommodation where you deal with what is there and even though you're uncomfortable with it, both as an enslaved person, as an enslaver, you allow it to happen. Um, and so of course there would be resistance on both sides. Um, and to the point in fact, where I'm sort of going the opposite direction because it became a, a psychological condition to want to run away as a slave. And that was called, what's it, drapetomania, something like that. So that meant you were mad as a slave to want to run away. Um, that was something wrong with you. Um, and that was one of the early diagnoses of mental illness. Um, so, do you know, I'm sort of going back away, swinging away from people who think, yes, let's run away to the other um, people who say, well, why do you need to run away? You're a slave, you're enslaved, that's your status. And it's all about what is your status. Um, so that's up, uploading the question, really. Excuse my light then, actually. I look, look like some yes. quite, actually, I look better than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, You've a bit Halloween, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I look far better like this. Chris. <laughs> no, I guess the wife is behind as well, sorry, never mind. There we go. <laughs> Is that worse? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, right back to, to Audrey with this one. Does the panel think that views of sustained slavery persist in, in, in culture today? So, Audrey? Do, do, do I think, sorry, repeat it. I probably use my ears. I'm not hearing. No problem. Does the panel think that the views sustain, that sustained slavery persist through racism today? Oh, that's a big one. Um, yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, I think that there are atrocities that happen in our society still, and we normalize them up to a point. And it's very hard to, for instance, um, I, I mean, I have a sort of, I kind of feel I'm a bit of, well, I keep saying I'm optimistic and, um, oh, what's the word, idealistic and all those things. But I don't agree with war, for instance. I don't agree with killing animals for food, for instance. And 
I would hope that we get to the point where those things are not seen to be things we have to do. Just the way that slavery is seen to be not a thing we do anymore. Um, and yet there's still lots of oppressions that we keep as being normal. The way we eat our food, the way our clothes come to us, the way industri industry operates. There are so many things that society could do differently at the moment that we're not really... And for instance, environmentalism, you know, we could go on in terms of things we could do better on as a human group, as, human, as humanity that could make us all happier if we were to make some changes, which are actually being opposed on us, whether we like it or not. So perhaps we all get there. For instance, we can't fly as much as we'd like. We can't go on holiday abroad as which, you know, the, so we might actually, the globe might do what it has to do and make us all better, whether we like it or not. <laughs> Sorry, it's not there. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if the, the other two pilots agree. I think, I think Audrey, Audrey covered, covered, covered it there, really. Um, uh, I want to do another one from Andrew. Do we need to, this is a big, big question, do we re need to reorient the curriculum to understand migration in general, both involuntary and voluntary? Um, Marian? Yeah, well, we're very lucky in Wales because what the um, Senate has just appointed Professor Charlotte Williams, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with Charlotte, do, do, do look her up. She, she's an exceptional woman. She's of Caribbean and Welsh heritage. She wrote the book um, Sugar and, and Slate about her experiences of growing up as a mixed race person in, in North Wales. She is heading a, a group that is um, re-looking at teaching resources on black history in, in Wales. The process has just started and um, it'll be taking place over, over the next few months. And so, yes, absolutely, it is being looked at within the curriculum in Wales and with such a powerful person leading it, it's going to be very effective indeed. It all depends, of course, how much time it's given within the curriculum, no matter how many, I know the curriculum for Wales is changing now, and it's, it's freer for teachers to choose which subject they actually want, want to teach. And you may only get something like, you know, half an hour per week. Um, but the material will be there and hopefully because it's been given so much prominence by what's been happening um, recently that teachers will pick up on this valuable um, resource once it's available to them. Fantastic. Um, uh, audio, Chris, anything to add to that? Or? I, I, I thanks Marion for that detail and I feel optimistic about Wales as a part of the UK because it's got, it's changing its national curriculum to, from my point of view to be very creative and vibrant. And it's also got the history of recognizing oppression and it's willing and it's embedded in its law to do something about racism. And, you know, as I said the last time when I looked at the Welsh National Anthem and looked at other anthems, I hope we all go in the direction. They're high aspirations, but I believe that Wales is actually leading the way in so many ways. So I'm very proud to, to sort of be resident in Wales, if not Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well said. And I can I echo, I, I feel very optimistic about Wales, not necessarily as part of the UK, but there, there we go. That's, that's just me. Uh, 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 so, sorry, Alec, uh, we're going to tie it up with the last question. Uh, Alec Eilig is asking us, in, in terms of Welsh history, because this is about Welsh history, even though we haven't spoken much about it because the questions haven't been framed in Welsh history, but in terms of Welsh history and slavery, um, what areas of research are exciting? Probably may aimed at, at Marianne and Chris a little bit more. Marianne and Chris at the moment, where, where do you think the history of Wales and slavery is, 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 is going next. Uh, Marian? Um, I think it's actually very exciting. What we have is a, it, there's, there's a, um, I think this is a point that, that Chris has mentioned several times when he gives presentations and the fact that Wales as a whole has always tended to shy away from um, approaching this, this, this subject. It's, it has ignored many, many clear references that have been written that connect Wales clearly to slavery over, over, over the, the past. But now there's a, um, I think there is a, there is a new appetite for it. And we find that people, there are a lot more courses in Wales that are teaching Wales and slavery or connections to slavery. Um, there's a lot more being written. I think the, the community project, um, Sheep to Sugar, 
um, did so much in spreading the word about the connections of rural groups uh, to how rural communities were connected to, to slavery, because it doesn't matter really how many academics look at the sub subject, it's only when it gets out into the public sphere that it really begins to embed and people really begin to take notice of, of that history. Excellent, Maya. Chris? Well, one thing I'd like to see is a history of Welsh abolitionism. One of the things that people often say is that, oh, well, Wales with its long history of radical opposition to slavery, but that seems to me a, uh, a proposition that has to be proved rather than an assumption that can just casually be made. So I think we should have some intensive investigations to, in, into how abolitionism worked and to what extent it worked in Wales. I think that would be really, really valuable because it would highlight some of the strategies and tactics of people who are opposed to slavery, who lived in often very remote, poorly connected rural locations. How did people like that manage to resist slavery if they did um, in an era when most of Britain was industrialising and urbanising very rapidly when there was a proliferation of newsprint across most parts of most parts of England, conditions that weren't quite replicated in Wales. So I'd like to see a serious study of Welsh abolitionism that could point out Welsh peculiar particularity and um, suggest some of the ways perhaps we could emulate our, uh, our forebears today. Excellent, super Chris. Audrey, what more in a cultural sense? Where would you like to, to, to see, see Wales reconcile itself perhaps with, with, with this part with slavery? I would like, I think what you're doing is a good example of really putting it out in public because I know both Chris and Marion do amazing work in, t in terms of both their narrative and their community involvement and I keep encouraging Marion to get that book published um, <laughs> because she's done so much and, and I do think it's often it's individuals who have to do the legwork and get the story out there um, and then uh, because I do find that there's little resistance to the story the narrative once it is being told and shared and as people build you know Welsh people build up um, you know, we can, I think people, from what I, my experience is that um, there's little defensiveness so far about Wales and slavery. Um, more surprise, um, because I think the Welsh, from my experience, feel they've been hard done by, by the, British, the English. So to think that they have done this to another group, they feel a bit guilty. Um, and I think the more that people discuss the global narrative of slavery, the more we can move together forwards. And well, Wales as a nation obviously is in a position where it can move forwards with that narrative. Oh, super. I, I, can, I, can I thank all three of you again? I thought some fantastic contributions from, from, from all three. And I, I apologise individually to you all for, leave, for being third in any question because it must be the most impossible task because you all, all get such full and excellent answers. I'd like to hand you back to, to uh, Ian now. Ian, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Darren. Uh, yeah, excellent, brilliant, outstanding. On behalf of everyone, I'd like to extend grateful thanks once again, Darren, Chris, Marion, Audrey. That was, that was amazing. Great to have the chance to go into more depth with you about some of the powerful material in your original presentations and also to cover much uh, new ground this evening. Thanks again. Particular thanks to all of you for your comments and questions via chat. Um, just to let you know, the fifth and final event in our summer series will be taking place this coming Saturday, 29th of August at 11 a.m. The topic will be Paul, Paul Robson and his connections to Wales. Uh, details have been emailed out to members today and there is also a link to register via Eventbrite on our website and Twitter pages. 
Really hope you'll be able to join us once again. The Clava website also carries details of how to join Clava. Hopefully tonight's event will have inspired you to subscribe if you're not yet a member. Many thanks once again and hopefully see you at our next event on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you.